right, it's 2 p.m. Let's get started. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Veer Muchendi. I'm Chief Architect for Container Solutions uh, with Red Hat. Uh, today's topic, securing applications on a container platform. Uh, when I say container platform here, I specifically mean uh, uh, a Kubernetes-based container platform. Uh, of late, uh, in, in the last couple of years, all known vendors have switched on to Kubernetes. So I'm going to be focused on securing applications on a Kubernetes platform. Uh, the goals of our session today, uh, we will talk about, uh, we'll quickly look at uh, uh, containers and how they work. And then we'll look at how can, how we can deal with container security at the host operating system level. We'll think about how container security works at build time, uh, how container security works at runtime, and then we'll look at what additional features we should be looking at a platform, uh, a Kubernetes-based platform, and what can we expect from it. Now, uh, the the intent of this session is for the audience to go from where we don't know what we don't know in terms of uh, securing applications on a Kubernetes platform to at least to a state where we know what to look for, right? So we don't know what, what we don't know to we know what we don't know kind of thing, right? So this is not a session where I'm uh, going to give all answers to all your questions. It's more of you know what, what the list of questions is. That's the intent of the session. So let's, let's uh, spend a quick few minutes to understand how containers work and why th this will give us the ground to understand why container security is extremely important. So in order to understand how container work, containers work, we will compare containers with uh, virtualization for a minute. So think about virtualization. This is something that you all know about, but I'm just trying to uh, put the thought in your mind so that you can clearly visualize how things are, right? So we have a physical infrastructure on the top of which we run hypervisor in case of virtualization. And that hypervisor allows us to share the physical resources across multiple sandboxes, which we call as virtual machines. And each virtual machine will run its own operating system. And on the top of that operating system, we, we install libraries, we install middleware, we install our own applications and run. Now, each VM has its own full, complete operating system. And for example, VM1 could be running Red Hat Enterprise Linux. VM2 could be running Windows. VM3 could be running Ubuntu and things like that. All of them can coexist peacefully on the same infrastructure. Now come to the world of containers. Things are a little different here. Uh, the underlying infrastructure could be a physical machine or a virtual machine. It doesn't matter. Now, on that host, you are running an operating system, which is called a host operating system from the uh, container standpoint. And you run a bunch of containers on the top of that host. And all these containers include all the layers that you need your application to run. So for example, if your application is a Java app and it expects some middleware to run, let's say Tomcat, that's included inside the container. And that Tomcat expects a, a Java runtime that's included inside the container. And that Java runtime expects some operating system libraries that's also included inside the container. However, all the containers that are running on a host will share the kernel coming from that host operating system that you're, that, that is set up on that box. As opposed to in the world of VMs, every VM gets its own kernel because VM gets a complete operating system, right? That's the key difference. Now, with that being said, one of there is a common misunderstanding on how containers run on the top of a container host. So think about a container host as a host with the host operating system, which includes a kernel, right? On the top of which a bunch of processes run, non-container processes, any daemons, so let's, let's say SSHD or FTP or anything like that, non-container processes are running on that host. And you also have a container engine that runs containers. But the common misconception is that the containers will run on the top of container engine. This is, this is incorrect. So what is right? So containers are like regular non-container processes that run on the top of the container host. Container engine will talk to the kernel and spin up those container processes. That's the role of container engine. It is not that the containers are processes that are running on the top of container engine. That's incorrect. Now, if that's the if if that's how the containers run, if they are actually 
running on the top of the kernel and sharing the kernel along with other processes, then there are some issues that we that come to mind in terms of security, right? So think about think about it this way. Let's say <clears throat> you are a developer and you have built a container and you are running on a container host. And I am another developer, but this case in in this case, let's say I am a rogue developer and you are a angel developer, right? So as a rogue developer, I built a container. Uh, my container is sharing kernel along with your container. What prevents my container from not going and tampering your resources, your container resources? In fact, what prevents my container process from not going and tampering system resources, right? Because I'm sh we are both sharing the same kernel and I'm sharing the kernel along with the rest of the system. So what prevents me from going and hacking into the system itself, right? That's question number one. Question number two. Uh, let's say I'm a bad programmer this time. You're still a good programmer, right? Uh, we have our containers running on the same host. What prevents my badly written program to from not consuming all the resources on that host, like CPU, memory, and all, and grow bigger and bigger? And what prevents it from choking other containers, right? That's question number two. Question three. Uh, we are both good programmers this time, right? But you are writing your code in, let's say, uh, PHP. I am writing my code in JavaScript. These are different technologies running on the same host and different containers. But how can these coexist together at the same time? What if my the version of Java gets upgraded, which is going to impact me or impact you, right? Can How can they uh, exist on the same host without fighting with each other in terms of the libraries that they are going to use, version of libraries that they are going to use and all that, right? Who, who provides that isolation? That's question number three. So let's think about how the containers will share the same kernel and how container security is works in uh, in order to control access to the kernel as well as protect the host and other containers on the top of the host, right? So let's think about how container technology works in this way from the host operating system perspective. Host operating system is the most important thing when it comes to container. The kind of host operating system you are using is extremely important from container security standpoint because containers are things that are enabled by the core technologies that are provided by the host operating system. Let's look at what these are. So from host OS perspective, uh, you have things like Linux namespaces, Linux control groups, SE Linux, and a bunch of other things. Well, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. The last problem that I talked about, isolation, where the containers can run in their own realm without impacting each other. How is that possible? That's pos possible because we have this concept called Linux namespaces that the Linux operating system provides. There are different kinds of namespaces. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, PID namespaces, for example, it's, called, it's also called process namespaces. So if you think about the processes running on your Linux system, so let's say you log on to your Linux system as a system administrator and you type in PS, you'll see a list of process IDs of all the processes that are running on that box. Every process will have its ID, right? Now, your container, if it is a process, that also gets a process ID. Let's say that container's process ID is uh, 1050. Uh, let's assume that, right? Now, if you go into the container, and then type in the PS inside the container itself, you'll see that first process of container is process ID number one. This is possible because each Linux process can be assigned more than one process ID. And uh, Linux, uh, the, the PID namespace makes use of that. So each process, the container process, gets two process IDs, one from the system admin's perspective and the other thing from the container's own perspective. And any processes that are spun up by this container's root process, which is process ID number one, will get a separate process ID. So you have your own process tree that is formed inside a container. And if you are getting to a container and run PS, you'll only see the process tree that is spun up by that container's root process, not anything else that is running on the system. So even though you have multiple containers running on that host, You'll not see all those processes when you type in PS inside a container. You'll see only those processes or process IDs that belong to that container's process tree and with its own set of process IDs. That's how PID namespace works. So you now understood how 
the process isolation works with PID namespaces, right? In the same way, there is network namespaces, which provides network, iso network isolation with individual virtual network stack for each container. So in the same way, there are different kinds of namespaces, mount namespaces, UTFs namespaces, IPC namespaces. The recent introduction is user namespaces, which allows you to have your own set of user IDs that are mapped to uh, your own container from, from, from the uh, user IDs that are given on the host. So a user ID on the host could be 10,000, but in your container, that could be mapped as root user. Right, so you can have your own root inside the container that acts as a root inside the container. From but from the host perspective, it is user ID ten thousand. So even if the user escapes out of the container process and gets to the host, that user doesn't have the root privileges from that perspective. Right, that's how user namespaces are useful. User namespaces are not used much, but I just wanted to let you know that these there are different kinds of namespaces that provide you isolation. So this set of namespaces coming together is make is what is making containers possible, number one. Uh, we'll look at this other issue. Uh, what prevents my badly written container from choking all your other containers, right? This is where another technology, Linux technology called Linux control groups comes into play. What does this do? Linux control groups ensures that a you are setting upper limits in terms of how much CPU, how much memory, how much network bandwidth a, con a particular container can use. And once you set those uh, those limits, kernel will enforce those limits. So when you spin up a container, a Linux host will set up a control groups setting in terms of how much you can your container can consume and how much it can grow to a maximum, right? And the kernel will enforce those limits. The third technology, which is not applicable for all uh, for all kinds of containers and all operating systems. This is the reason why I said choosing the right operating system is important. This is more of a uh, additional fire, uh, additional uh, protection around your containers, like jailing, which is provided by uh, SE Linux and with type inform enforcement. What does this do? It applies mandatory access control in addition to the dis discretionary access control that we already use. What does that mean? So in, in case of discretionary access control, we are actually preventing access to resources or provide uh, allowing access and preventing access to the resources based on user group and others. We are all aware of how, how to make those settings, right? So, but in the world of SE Linux, we use a technology called mandatory access control, which means that by default, you don't have any access and we allow access by a process of labeling the system. Every, when you have a Linux running in enforcing mode, every resource will get a label and every process gets a label and you set up policies called SE Linux policies that allow processes with so-and-so label to access resources with so-and-so label. So when your container processes get created, they'll be running with the type S word LXC net T, right? This will, this will be the label assigned to the process and the container content, all the resources that are inside the container will be given a sword sandbox file T. Now policies are set up so that the processes with so-and-so label can access these resources with so-and-so label. What this helps you to do is that the container process cannot actually go and uh, steal data or make any manipulations with the system resources because SLNX will not allow it. So even if there is a issue uh, a vulnerability that someone gets out of the container process and tries to access the system and make some changes, SA Linux will come in the way and prevent it because this is an additional layer of protection. It's a jail around the container. Now, how do we protect one container from another container? There is another technology called multi-category security, MCS for short, which assigns a unique random label to each container process using which a specific container can only access its own resources, not somebody else's resources, right? This is how containers are protected with each other. So SLNX protects system resources from the container processes and multi-category security in association with SLNX will provide, uh, will protect containers from each other. So I'll be sharing this presentation uh, later, but if you wanna take a photograph, I'll wait for a few seconds, right?
this is a very good book where you can learn in detail about SE Linux. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Uh, Linux capabilities. This is another thing that we need to be aware of at the operating system level. <clears throat> um, the root, if you say I am a root user, right? With Linux kernel 2.2, root privileges are divided into 32 distinct capabilities. Now, actually, it has increased to 37. Now, these capabilities uh, are the ones that a, a root user with all the capabilities enabled is actually a root in, in, uh, in the Linux today, right? But out of all these capabilities, certain capabilities are extremely dangerous, like net admin, which allows you to configure the network, sysad sysadmin. This is more or less like getting the root access, right? These are, there are some powerful capabilities. So when it comes to running the containers, it becomes very important in terms of what capabilities is that container running with. So the process that is running the container with what user ID is it running and what, what is it allowed to do, the default capabilities that are available to a container are extremely important. So when Docker container was uh, were built with this. This is over a period of time, right? So, fourteen default capabilities were made available in a Docker container. Now, the ones that you are seeing on the screen are those fourteen different capabilities. Having said that, these uh, these are made very generic so that any container can run uh, without any issues, right? But do we really need all these fourteen different capabilities? So for example, look at that audit write where you can uh, write messages to audit log, right? Uh, the audit subsystem. Uh, this was enabled to uh, so that you can actually run an SSH daemon, daemon inside the container because in the initial days, they thought that SSH, you would want to SSH into a container. But eventually, you don't need, uh, need that actually. You can use, for example, uh, Docker exec or Podman exec to get into the container it, it is actually uh, it is off late actually not encouraged to have uh, or nobody runs as such a daemon inside the container off late right so that capability can easily be disabled so having unnecessary capabilities enabled is it is a problem so one of the things you need to be thinking about is when i'm running on a container platform the tools that are coming with the platform do they allow me to uh, add completely disable all the capabilities and only add those capabilities that are needed by my container, right? That's a thing you need to keep in mind. So for example, Podman is a tool. Uh, this is also allowed with Docker where you can specifically enable particular capability with, capabilities with CapAd. Um, if you are uh, building a container using a Docker file, you can actually specifically, specifically say that these capabilities are enabled for my container by labeling that by, by adding a label dot io dot containers dot capabilities, right? So when your container gets built, it, it will ask for those specific capabilities to be enabled. So you can specifically declare which capabilities are needed. All other capabilities can be disabled when you're running your container. Next thing, the system calls. So your container is a process and every process as you know, makes the system calls. Now, which calls are allowed from your container to the system? That, that also has important implications on security. So you can use Berkeley Packet Filter System, uh, BPF, right, to filter those calls that are not really required, right? But how do I apply that? That's where the SecComp profiles come into play. When you are running your container, you can tell that container that it is running with so and so seccom profile so that only those calls that are allowed by that profile are allowed to go into the system now next question from your side could be how do i know which calls which system calls should be allowed by this container this will become the responsibility i mean this is still work in progress but this is this will become the responsibility of a container developer so the developer after building their container would, when they are testing, one of the things that they can test is use a seccom filter generator. There are tools like that which are being being built. And using this generator, you can, let's say you, you test it for all possible use cases, right? And you see what 
uh, syscalls are, are being made by this container. You capture those and you create a profile out of it, a seccom profile, and provide that profile along with your container. Now, when you are running your container along with the seccom profile, only those specific calls that you said are should be allowed are allowed. Now, how is that going to help? Let's say if a hacker gets into a container and takes hold of your container, and if the hacker is trying to make system calls to the kernel and trying to get hold of the kernel, right? That will not happen because your seccom profile will prevent unnecessary calls, system calls from going going from your container process to the kernel, right? That's how that will be prevented. So you need to be thinking about which container platforms would allow me to supply my own seccom profile when I'm running my containers. This this is important when you are actually running applications, especially in secured environments. Next, read-only mount points. Operating system has uh, several mount points which are actually required by your containers to uh, container environment to run. But fortunately, these most of these can be mounted as read-only. And there are platforms that will prevent, they'll block the ability of your privileged container processes from remounting these file systems are as read write so for example if you are running a container process as a privileged container and some if someone hacks hacks it they may be able to go and uh, change it uh, remount that file system to read write right so some platforms like openshift will stop you from doing that so you need to be aware of that as well so so far we talked about different things that are uh, relevant from the host operating system perspective what need, what what do you need to keep in mind right now let's get into the build time security. So from build perspective, what is included inside your container is extremely important, right? So what is your container made up of and where the container runs? So we talked about the host operating system. Your container itself includes some operating system libraries, your container runtimes, and then comes your application. So if, if there is an application developer, the application developer is just writing their code. They may be writing their code in whatever language they are doing, Node.js or Java or whatever that is, right? They only know about that, but they don't know about the other layers of the container that they are using to deploy their application into. So am I getting these container images with which I'm providing to my developers or my developer is using these container images are these images coming from trusted sources? That's something that's extremely important. Are these containers that are running uh, running on a known trusted platform, which includes a trusted host operating system? We already talked about the host operating system, right? So that becomes extremely important on where you source your container images from, the base container images from, uh, where you will add your application code on the top of, right? Then, then the, it's not just the first time thing, right? Your container images that you are getting from those known sources, are those sources also exposing or providing some kind of a health index? Because the vulnerabilities can change every day. You are not, uh, if the container is secure today, that doesn't mean that it is secure tomorrow, right? There may be newer issues, new vulnerabilities. So is the source that is providing you these container images also providing a health index? Are they measuring the issues that are this, the vulnerabilities that are available on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis and showing you where the container health index is, right? So that's also important. So when you choose a source, you also think about, uh, are the sources clearly telling me what kind of security data is available around these containers and how it is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Third, provenance of an image. So is, is where is this image coming from? Who created it? How, is the image signed by the source that has created it? Right, these are all important because you, should, you need to know where this container, uh, the, the complete provenance of that image. Not just that, you also should have the ability to sign the image and the platform on which you are running the container should be able to verify that image and run only trusted containers, right? So does the platform support all these features? That's another th thing to keep in mind. So uh, what you're seeing here is an example of uh, how uh, you can use tools like Podman to sign, sign a container, 
uh, private registries. Uh, when you create the containers and uh, you use the containers in your enterprise, you may not be actually willing to push your IP, your uh, container images for your applications into a public registry, right? So how do I, what kind of private registries am I going to use? Can I set up my own enterprise uh, registry? How do I ensure that the registry is always up? Um, I'm, how can, can I use both a private registry that, that I can install within my enterprise as well as some uh, uh, private, uh, private section of the registry on a on a public uh, resource things like that things that you need to keep in mind in terms of how where do i save my container images and uh, what kind of registry am i using what kind of features are available in these registries there are different kinds of private registries that are possible so you have choices to choose from but you would want to evaluate different registry technologies and and make those choices um next uh just wanted to make sure that there are no issues okay um restricting the registry sources so you have the developers who are using your container platform and they are using this technology the container images could be stored anywhere right can you can your platform stop the developers from pulling images from wherever they want can you actually specify the registries that are uh, that are allowed and the registries that are blocked in your container platform that's also important so when you are evaluating a container platform keep this in mind on whether i am able to restrict or uh, or block the registries that i don't want my developers to pull images from Image management responsibilities. So I have uh, who does what in, in the world of container platform. So I have uh, uh, my operations team, my infrastructure administrators who are who have been controlling the trusted uh, base images for the operating system. Can they continue to do that? Right? Can they can they be the people who choose the OS layer of, of my container? Uh, second, uh, uh, my middleware engineering team are the ones who decide what kind of middleware is appropriate for use in my enterprise. Can they continue to choose that? Can they be actually building tools and technologies to build the containers that the developers would create? So developers are just writing the code. How is that code getting uh, compiled and built into a container? Can that process be predefined? In the world of uh, OpenShift and Red Hat, we call that source to image process. And there are, there are build processes that are available with many different technologies. And controlling that build process is extremely important. And who does that? Can that be, can that be defined in an enterprise-wide uh, way so that it can be done in a secured fashion? Can the build happen in a secured fashion, in a controlled fashion? Right. That's, that's important. And who does that? Middleware engineering team. Development team would be only worried about writing their code that meets the business requirements, the business use cases, right? So that's the topmost layer. So they will be ensuring that, that the code is clean. There are no, they'll do static code analysis of their own written code and all that. So if we can divide the responsibilities of the container image itself which layer comes from or which layer is managed by which team that and, and if the platform allows you to make those images available so that the developers can consume easily for example if they are building a spring boot application can the spring boot trusted image be made available inside a catalog in my um, in my enterprise uh, ca service catalog so that i can pull that image and write my Java code, add that layer on the top of that image, and then deploy it, right? If that is the kind of experience developers can get, that's the best to look for, rather than expecting the developers to build everything from bottom to top inside a container, right? So that's another thing to keep in mind from the build time security perspective. Now let's move on to container scanning, identifying vulnerabilities. So 
from scanning perspective, think about when do I scan containers for vulnerabilities? What should be the frequency? There are different ways of doing it, and multiple ways are important. So you would want to scan your containers as soon as they are created, because if there are any vulnerabilities, you would want to fix them even before the container gets into the next cycle of testing, let's say, from development. Uh, scan containers that get into enterprise registry. There are technologies that are available today that where you push your image into a container registry, and as soon as it gets pushed, it gets scanned immediately. You can also set up that scanner to run every once in a while to identify any new vulnerabilities over a period of time. Right, Ongoing basis, how do I identify vulnerabilities for my running application on my platform? These are different things to keep in mind in terms of when do I identify vulnerabilities? If there are new vulnerabilities that I didn't know about yesterday, how do I, how do I figure that out? How do I stop applications that are vulnerable from running in production if, if, I, if it has to, right? Things like that. So scanning containers at the time of creation. So what you are seeing right now is an example of a pipeline, right? So you have, for example, you may be doing a build process where you are building the artifacts and then saving those artifacts. And you are pulling the source code from the Git repo, building the artifacts, and you archive the artifacts into, a, uh, into an artifact repository like Nexus. And uh, maybe after that, uh, you uh, uh, do the unit testing and uh, uh, static code analysis. Maybe after that, you do a uh, build of a container. As soon as the container gets built, uh, you may be deploying that into a development environment. But before that, you may be actually pushing that into a registry. As soon as that it gets pushed into a registry, Registries like Red Hat Square have uh, tools like Clear Scanner, which will go and run the scanning on the top of it and identify if there are any vulnerabilities and show you directly. Eventually, in the build process, before once you are done with testing, before you actually move it into the next environment, you may actually want to scan that image to identify any vulnerabilities with other kind of scanning tools. It could be open scap scanning. It could be scanners coming with uh, the tools like uh, uh, JFrog X-ray or uh, uh, or uh, Black Duck or uh, uh, Twistlock, right? Th th there are many technologies available today that come with their own repositories of uh, the vulnerabilities and uh, issues that are possible in open source. And the scanners can go against those registries and scan and provide you a report of what kind of issues can exist in your code right? In that, with that container. And when you are happy with that, that's when it gets into the next stage of life cycle, where it goes from, uh, uh, from dev to QA, for example. So you can incorporate scanning as part of your registry. You can incorporate scanning as part, uh, as part of your pipeline itself. There are different kinds of scanning tools available in the market today. Uh, Clear, for example, is a, is an open source scanner that comes with uh, uh, Red Hat Square. Uh, Black Duck is Black Duck, JFrog X-ray, Twistlock, Sysdig. All these uh, different tool vendors provide their own container scanning solutions. These technologies not only scan when you want to scan, but they are also running on the platform on a Kubernetes platform all the time, and they are continuously scanning. Uh, against the known vulnerabilities at any point of time, and they can report if there are issues at any point of time. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, what else can we expect from container platforms? So one of the things uh, is uh, policy-based governance. There are tools, for example, uh, uh, Red Hat's uh, ACM, Advanced Cluster Management Tool, includes features where you can do policy-based governance and risk and compliance monitoring from a central tool. This ACM has features to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters from a single location. And at the same time, you can also um, enforce policies. You can say cluster number one will have to meet so-and-so's uh, uh, policy standard. And at that point of time, from that point of time, that cluster, cluster will be configured to meet that, that compliance policy. And if there are any issues, this tool can show you from a centralized location. right? 
these are kind of additional features that some of the container platforms will provide you. Um, from the authentication and authorization perspective, we all know that Kubernetes includes an OAuth server, which with which you can integrate with uh, well-known identity providers outside. These include uh, LDAP, GitHub, GitLab, Google Authentication, any of those sources, right? So you would want to do the authentication with your enterprise authentication identity provider so that the authentication is delegated to those identity providers. And for authorization, Kubernetes includes authorization by using role bindings at the individual namespace level as well as the, at the cluster level. So uh, when Kubernetes, the containers will, in, in the past, they run with the role assigned to a specific user called a service account. This service account concept was initially there in, op in OpenShift, and eventually it got uh, pushed into Kubernetes as well. So make use of this feature where you can control which particular service account can do what on your cluster, right? That way you can set authorization settings to control what a service a specific container can do and what it is not allowed to do. There is another thing that got added into Kubernetes uh, called pod security policies. This was done last year. And uh, the uh, this comes from, the root of this comes from uh, security context constraints. This, again, this is a feature that has been, been there in OpenShift for many years and uh, eventually, uh, a, a, a part of it is now part of uh, Kubernetes called pod security policies. Uh, make use of this because this will allow you to, your administrator to set up policies in such a way that a container, when it comes up, by default, you don't want your container to have privileged access, right? You want, you want very, very restricted access to your for your container. And if required, yeah, the administrator can elevate the security as long as you justify on why your container would need some specific additional permissions. So for example, in case of security context constraints, there are different kinds of SS SCCs available. The default is restricted in an OpenShift cluster. And if you want to, uh, with restricted, if let's say you're trying to run a container that requires to run as a root, that container will not even come up. The, container platform with SCC as restricted by default will not allow a container that is running as a privileged user to come up at all. If you have a, a proper reason that you can go and justify with your cluster administrator, then the cluster administrator will verify that and would be able to change the SCC for your service account with which your pod is running to a different level. So for example, if you want to run the your container as uh, privileged, then he can, and if you can, if you can justify it, then the administrator can change the service accounts SCC as privileged, right? That way, there is a controlled way of elevating the privileges for those specific workloads that you can justify. Now, let's talk about application level security where applications are running as containers. You can do micro segmentation by using a technology called network policy objects. Again, you have to uh, look at your uh, container platform and the software defined networking solution that comes with your container platform on whether it supports network policy objects or not. What it allows you to do is uh, set up policies so that only specific calls from specific services are allowed. So for example, Let's say this is an application that includes a bunch of microservices. Say uh, my, there are a few different microservices here. For example, this particular microservice that is running in Tomcat is not allowed to uh, talk to a MySQL database because, because it's this database is private to this particular service called email microservice, right? Now, how do you prevent those kind of calls, random calls from happening, right? That's where network policy objects come, in, come into play. You lock down everything by default and you add specific policies that will allow specific calls to happen based on how you define your application. And that's how you can implement micro segmentation with network policy objects. These are policies. These policies are applied as simple YAML files on the top of your, once you deploy your application. So you can lock down everything by just applying a YAML, 
and uh, you can open up specific connections by again applying those policies which are just yamls right so the this will allow you to do micro segmentation for your applications now ssl um, ssl can, uh, is possible with uh, your kubernetes workload specifically in in the world of openshift openshift provides something called a openshift router that allows three different kinds of uh, term, SSL termination. One is an edge termination where the router has a certificate and uh, the client has a certificate and SSL is between the client and the router. And between the router and your application that is running as containers on, on your platform, that, that, that is unsecured. The other way in which you can deploy it is called pass-through termination where the, the uh, decryption is not done by the router and it has to be handled by your application. That means you're building the SSL encryption decryption into your application itself. And that's where you can use pass through. The third is re-encrypt where you are using separate certificate between the router and your, uh, your client. And uh, between the router and your application, you have a separate private certificate, right? So that's how re-encrypt will work. Now, this is all at the edge level, right? What about uh, uh, and and then what about uh, if I want to uh, whitelist only specific IP addresses through my ingress? The router also has ability to whitelist specific IP addresses so that all calls are not allowed inside, only specific calls coming from specific IP addresses are allowed. That way you can restrict where the calls are made from. Then what about my end-to-end -end security, all the microservices that I, that I have deployed on my cluster should be protected. If that's the case, you can always implement your mutual TLS between the microservices deployed on your cluster by on your own. But if you are using tools like uh, Istio, a service mesh, service mesh provides, has capabilities by using Istio auth, or, or it's, it's, it has been renamed as Citadel which will actually use the same service account, Kubernetes service account, and generate certificates. And it will assign those certificates to the sidecar proxies that are running alongside with your application in each part. And mutual TLS can be enabled between any microservices running on, on, on your cluster, on your Istio cluster. This way, you can easily enable mutual TLS across your microservices running on your cluster. Now, this will also do the certificate rotation. Uh, you can also configure periodic rotation of the keys and all that. Secrets to store sensitive data. You have passwords, uh, configuration files, uh, Docker configs, and things like that that are used by your application. Kubernetes provides secrets. Don't just mount these as uh, regular data uh, into your container. Save it as secrets. Use the right tools for right things, right? Uh, when you are using secrets, they'll never come to rest on the nodes. And they are stored in its CD, and they are encrypted. So secrets can also be stored in, uh, uh, in vault kind of solutions. And you, they can be pulled only at the time, at runtime if desired. So you can store it as secrets, number one. And if if your security requirements are stringent, then also explore the possibility of using solutions like Vault. Let's get to egress. So I have my applications running as containers on the top of a container platform, but this application is these applications are also making calls to external systems that are running outside. These external systems could be, let's say, databases or my uh, ERP, SAP system that is running outside my uh, outside my cluster, right? How do I make sure that the calls go outside in a secure fashion? Can, can they be passed through a firewall? If so, how do I make sure that the IP address that is coming out of this uh, is, is something that is consistent, which I can block using a firewall? Again, uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, the solution is there with an open shift kind of a cluster. I'm not sure if there is anything like that from a Kubernetes cluster. What open shift provides is that it, it gives a uh, egress mechanism where you can configure an egress IP at individual namespace level or project level. And any communications that are going from any pods within that project will adopt that particular IP address, that e egress IP address. 
So when your firewall gets that call, it sees that IP address. And if that IP address is allowed to reach this external system, the call can be allowed. So you can still use firewalls with uh, for egress traffic coming out of your cluster with this kind of a mechanism. Another feature, uh, egress firewalls to limit uh, access to specific systems. So you can do things like a pod can talk to, talk to specific hosts outside your cluster, but it cannot connect to the public internet. Or your pod can actually connect to public internet, uh, but it cannot uh, talk to other things. Or you can uh, provide connections to specific subnets outside your cluster, right? These kind of things are possible in on specific platforms like OpenShift. So you would want to think about your requirements from your application's egress perspective and keep those things in mind when you are uh, thinking about a container platform. Uh, so uh, from application security perspective, we talked about API management. We talked about uh, SSL secrets connecting to external services. So. Uh, I think I have reached the end of my time. If there are any quick questions, you can type them on the on the chat session, and I'll try to answer. 